So thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I will introduce you to the naked mole rat, my favorite animal. And for those who don't know the naked mole rat, um, this animal um, lives in, in the African continent and is part of a larger family of African mole rats called the Bathyrogaidae family. And these are all subterranean animals and the naked, they're all spread across the um, African continent and the naked morat is limited to this area here, the Horn of Africa. Um, it's split from the mouse and the rat uh, around 80 to 90 million years ago and the genome shares around 83% homology. The naked morat itself is the most extreme animal out of all of these animals, so some of the characteristics that I will talk about, the, the naked morat tends to have the most extreme version of it and it itself uh, split from the rest of its family about 30 million years ago. And so one very unique um, characteristic about the naked morat as a mammal is that it is eusocial, meaning that its social structure resembles that of bees and ants. So it has one breeding female and then it chooses one to two breeding males. And these are the only animals that then reproduce and the other animals are um, sexually suppressed. And the colonies of naked morats can get up to 300 individuals in nature. Um, so this is the living condition. So under the ground, they, it's composed of several burrow-like structures and they um, sort of burrow the tunnels around to connect these chambers and they choose chambers to sleep in. To, there's a toilet chamber, there's a feeding chamber. And outside of that, you can see that the, the place is quite arid. Um, it has very little vegetation, it's very dry. And therefore these animals do, um, inhabit a very extreme environment. So it is characterized by high CO2 because these burrows usually only have one opening and so the air inside of it gets quite stuffy. And um, so high CO2 because they're breathing a lot, it's low in oxygen. Um, the food sources are quite limited, um, also depending on the season. There's very limited water, so these animals um, in captivity actually don't drink at all and they receive their water only from from food or from molecular water, and they're also um, are constantly in darkness. And so to deal with these, these um, animals have evolved quite a number of molecular adaptations that help them survive these extreme conditions. And some of these include poikilothermia, so it's also the only basically cold-blooded mammal that, that is known. As I mentioned, it's eusocial. It has retained many pedomorphic traits, which means that some of the traits that it has uh, resemble fetal-like or neonatal-like features. Um, it has resistance to many painful substances. Um, it also has a non-canonical insulin system and a myeloid-based immunity. And so these help it to survive these extreme environments, but it, they also protect the animal from stresses associated with diseases. And so this animal has become very interesting um, to biomedical research. So um, naked morats are basically resistant to cancer. So the the incidence of cancer in these animals has, you know, you can count them on your fingers and th there's been around 7,000 or more animals in captivity and you never really notice any cancers occur. Um, they also uh, have no decline in cardiac function with age. They're um, protected from neurodegeneration. They also do not decline in fertility with age. So a queen uh, retains her fertility throughout her long lifespan. And uh, these animals are famously very long lived. And so the oldest animal at the moment is 40 years old. And it's not really known what the maximal lifespan is because this animal in captivity is still alive. And so um, what, what I do in, in my lab is try to use hypoxia resistance as sort of a gateway to understand longevity in this, in this animal. And that's because hypoxia is involved in many, um, in the pathogenesis of many diseases such as cancer, myocardial infarction, um, kidney diseases and metabolic diseases. But also what I'm interested in is how this animal is me metabol metabolically flexible and how it can protect and repair its uh, tissues, which is which um, also ties in with how it reacts to hypoxia, and so um, these animals are famously um, 
resistant to low oxygen. And so what we've shown before is that they can survive for up to 18 minutes without any oxygen at all. And so you can see by this graph here that they basically, when you deplete their surroundings of oxygen, they can um, maintain their heart rate uh, at a very steady state. And then when you return them to normal air, they will just uh, raise their heart rate and basically return back to, they, they come out of sleep and then they return back to their colonies and they can interact and so they basically come out of this unharmed and so this is quite extraordinary because as you can imagine even holding your breath for one minute is difficult but these animals are also known to survive for days at three to five percent oxygen and if you compare this to a mouse a mouse can only do this for about 15 minutes and so we've been looking at how they achieve this via their metabolism, since metabolism is very key to um, keeping um, ATP levels, keeping energy, keeping um, membranes polarized and so on. And so what we did was we did a GCMS study where we took mice and naked mole rats and basically collected their tissues um, at different exposures of anoxia. Um, and so the pink bars are naked mole rats and the white ones are um, mice and you can see that uh, we analyzed several metabolites but one metabolite that really stood out is fructose which increased in its level so it, it basically was the same in the mouse and the naked morat at baseline levels and then as soon as you expose the animal to anoxia the animal then um, raised its fructose levels in basically most of its tissues. We also saw the appearance of sucrose, and this is quite uh, uh, this is quite intriguing because sucrose is actually only known to be synthesized by um, plants. But the naked morat seems to in increase sucrose, which is basically a disaccharide composed of one fructose and one glucose molecule. Um, and we saw this in several tissues and in the blood. Uh, when we harvested the organs at 30 minutes, the animal was no longer alive. Sucrose levels went into millimolar amounts. So they seem to be producing it and, poten and potentially because at 30 minutes they're no longer alive and using it, this is why it accumulated to such extreme amounts. And so we wanted to know where the fructose is coming from and there is, um, oh, sorry, where, where it's coming from. So we did a, 13C um, stable isotome labeled experiments where we gave 13C labeled glucose and 13C labeled fructose to both mice and naked morats and subjected them to hypoxia or normoxia and then we could trace the carbons coming from these um, from these two substrates and so what we were trying to see is if basically the fructose was coming from a known pathway called the polyol pathway um, which um, can synthesize fructose de novo from glucose. And this pathway sometimes goes a bit awry in, in, um, in diabetes, for example, where you have a lot of glucose and it tends to go into, into fructose, but generally one doesn't produce, a, a, an organism doesn't produce fructose just like this. And so what we had a look at is we gave the animals 13 C glucose and you can see that in the heart um, at normal conditions, the amount of 13 C labeled glucose in the heart is the same. And then under hypoxic conditions, we saw the labeled glucose enter the heart. So the naked morats are taking up more glucose into the heart under hypoxic conditions. And then this in turn get, goes into 13C labeled sorbitol, which is the rate limiting step of the polyol pathway. So they basically take this glucose up and then it makes sorbitol out of it, which then goes into, into fructose. And here you only see a little trend because the next step fructose to fructose 1 phosphate has very um, high kinetics. But you can see here that fructose 1 phosphate, which is a fructose. Um, which can only be synthesized from fructose is also increased and contains the labeled carbon, basically meaning that under low oxygen conditions, the naked morads turn on the polyol pathway to make fructose. Oh, sorry. So then we um, wanted to have a look at uh, other general pathways that might be turned on and be protected in the naked morad. So we did an RNA seq experiment on the animals that have undergone um, normoxia or hypoxia and compared mice and naked morads. And you can see here in the heart, we see a lot of changes that occur in the naked morad. So it has a lot of differentially expressed genes, whereas the mouse uh, has only a few differentially expressed genes. 
uh, which really shows that the Naked Moritz, which is on a very sort of harmonized protective program in the heart. And so we're now trying to find out what that what those programs are. Um, so via go enrichment analysis, you can see that uh, a lot of the transcription factors and um, for example, polymerase 2 activity is um, comes up there, which means that it turns on different programs to basically start a program to protect itself, transcriptional program to protect itself um, against low oxygen conditions. And for example, one of these uh, programs is metabolism. And here, uh, what we saw was that a lot of um, metabolic pathways associated with sugar metabolism, so polysaccharides, monosaccharides, glycogen, these pathways seem to be differentially expressed between hypoxia and normal oxygen conditions in the naked morat. So we started to explore that further. And so we did another anoxic metabolomics experiment by collecting um, organs at different times of anoxia in the naked morat in the mouse and we did a basically a non-targeted metabolomics approach and here you can see that this is just an example of some of the metabolites that uh, that came up and and here I showed two very different groups of metabolites so in the in the top section these are basically a signature of hypoxia you can say in a rodent where there's the metabolite is not there under normal conditions and then under low oxygen conditions these all these metabolites tend to go up both in the mouse and the naked morat however in the metabolites that are then highlighted in the brackets are the interesting ones because they are the ones that are low under normal conditions and they stay low in the mouse and only in the naked morat do they increase under anoxic conditions and so we're working through these metabolites one by one to try to understand what they do, whether they're involved in a more signaling pathway or whether they're part of a metabolic pathway. But now I will, since we had um, the sugars come up in the biological processes, I'm going to talk about the three metabolites that are highlighted in orange. So these are polysaccharides, small to tetro, small to triose, and disaccharide, and these are basically different lengths of a polysaccharide chain, so these are just different uh, amounts of glucose. And you can see that in the naked morat, these are um, pretty much the same as the mouse under normal conditions and under anoxic conditions they increase quite severely um, as soon as five minutes of anoxia and at, at least for the triose and disaccharide they just keep on increasing. Um, we see the same in the liver and we actually see the same in the liver also um, in the mouse and it's as if the naked morat has hijacked uh, a mechanism from, from the liver and has taken it into the heart and utilizes this. So then we had a look at uh, the hearts of the naked morats, and here you can already see the glycogen. So um, these black dots in the EM is glycogen and naked morats, when you take a slice, it just has glycogen everywhere. It tends to store the glycogen um, and you obviously do not see this in the, in the mouse. And here we also quantified it by different methods. So you can see that the naked morat has a lot more glycogen in the heart uh, compared to the mouse and it then is able to maintain its glucose levels under low oxygen conditions. So Normal glycogen breakdown usually goes by glu glucose 1-phosphate and then glucose 6-phosphate. However, and, but we, we saw these polysaccharides and so we started to look for basically what is happening with the non-canonical glycogen breakdown in these animals. And so one way to break down glycogen, and, and this happens in the intestine when you break down starch, is using amylase. And so amylase goes and chops up um, large starch or glycogen molecules into um, about four, three chain polysaccharides, and then maltose glucoamylase goes on and chops those up into glucose. And so because um, we often saw amylase actually much higher in the naked morad blood um, when we did just normal uh, clinical chemistry in the naked morad. We, went, we sort of connected the glycogen and the amylase and went on to look whether amylase could be responsible in the heart, which is uh, not has been, not ha amylase has not been shown to be involved in glycogen breakdown in other tissues. And so in the, in the naked morad, amylase 
seems to be expressed at the mRNA level and it can also be that its activity can be seen um, is much higher in the naked monad heart in the, than in the mouse and then it can be inhibited uh, via an amylase inhibitor. And so we also looked at the, the, at the second step of the pathway, the maltase glucoamylase, and this is also increased in the RNA level in the naked morat. Um, and so then we wanted to basically inhibit this pathway and see if we can lose the polysaccharide. But since we, we're not sure how much of this inhibitor one should be using under these conditions and um, how much amylase there actually is, we ended up actually increasing the polysaccharide level. And this is probably because the inhibitor is acting more on the on the second step and so we're basically uh, to some extent producing the polysaccharides but cannot turn them into into glucose. Sucrose however um, was able to be inhibited um, with with the amylase inhibitors so there seems to be a, a different kind of uh, pathway that is happening for for sucrose production and for the polysaccharide glucose production. So another way to uh, break down glycogen, which is not the canonical way, is by glycophagy, which is similar to autophagy, which basically recruits glycogen into an autophagosome, which then um, gets fused with the lys lysosome, and then an enzyme called GAA is able to break down the glycogen and release the glucose out of the lysosome. And so we wanted to have a look at whether potentially glycophagy is also occurring in the naked morat and here you can see that we do see these um, glycophagosomes um, in the naked morat heart. You can see that by the double membrane and the glycogen inside of it. And, and uh, at least one of, the, one of the genes that is responsible for recruiting the, the glycogen into a in, or glycophagy is upregulated in the naked morat heart. So then we used um, bifilomycin, which basically um, inhibits uh, the lysosome um, in order to see whether we can disrupt this pathway. And you can see that in the blue bar, um, you see an increase of glucose under hypoxia and, and using um, this inhibitor, we're able to decrease it and we're able to decrease the fructose as well, which potentially suggests that we're decreasing the, the glucose breakdown from, from glycogen and then the polyol pathway can also not uh, occur. Um, we also abolish sucrose under these conditions, which uh, might suggest that this non-canonical glycophagy pathway may also be involved in somehow breaking down the sucrose. And so these these animals are using uh, glycogen and fructose in order to um, power their glycolysis and you can see that by the increase of, of lactate under um, ischemic conditions as well as glycerate and glycerate is uh, a byproduct of uh, fructose breakdown. It, oh sorry. Um, and the, the reason why they might be uh, so they're using glycogen as a storage for, for glucose for, for these sort of stressful situations and they're using fructose as potentially a, a way to bypass um, a stop in the glycolysis pathway which occurs under, for example, low pH conditions. So in normal glycolysis, you, uh, the pathway gets inhibited by several uh, different things as well as uh, low pH and at the PFK1 um, enzyme there, that's a rate limiting step. And at this step, glycolysis starts to slow down. If you use fructose, fructose goes via ketohexokinase, which goes into fructose 1-phosphate. And this step can bypass the PFK1 um, inhibition and basically rejoin glycolysis downstream of this. So this allows glycolysis to go on unchecked and lifts off this inhibition from glycolysis, allowing ATP as well as um, glycolytic intermediates to, to be produced um, uninhibited. And so this naked morat's addiction to sugar may actually reveal some novel insights into cardiac protection under stressful conditions. So under normal conditions, both glycogen and fructose are probably very unhealthy things, but under stressful conditions, these can serve as uh, protective substrates. And so what we saw that under these conditions, ischemia, hypoxia, potentially starvation, glycogen breakdown via canonical as well as non-canonical routes, um, 
can can lead to it to protective um, to a protective outcome. And they also use fructose by synthesizing it, using it. And there's also a no novel sucrose source, which we're trying to find out where that's coming from. And there seems to be a very tight regulation that occurs in sort of um, activating these these pathways because um, without this regulation, then these can become actually um, detrimental rather than beneficial. And so these are all the things that we're trying to learn from the Naked Morant. And these are the people that contributed to these studies and the collaborators, both past and present. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jane, for this uh, beautiful and inspiring talk. Do we have any question here? Maxime. Really interesting, as usual. So you mentioned, of course, that naked mole rats have um, pedomorphic traits. So your observations of the, for example, the differential glycogen breakdown in the heart, is it specific to the naked mole rat or is it because it's in the morphic stage. So if you compare it with a mouse, so like in, you know, when it's developing just a few days you know, after birth, for example. Yeah, so I think the, gly the glycogen is interesting. So for sure, there's more glycogen in the neonatal heart. So there's about 30% of the cell volume, I think, in a, in a neonatal heart is glycogen, and then it gets reduced down to 2%. Whether or not, this is what we want to do, whether or not you see these polysaccharides come up is something that no one has reported before because this, these polysaccharides are only ever sort of reported in the intestine um, and never really in, in other organs. But this is something that we want to see whether all of the, whether it's just a conser conserved neonatal-like trait or whether there's something on top of that. And also I want you, I wonder if you can comment on the immune system of naked mole rats? The separate question. <laughs> Is it, do they have a less developed immune system? Yeah, so it's more, it's more innate uh, immune system. They um, don't have killer T cells. They, they have a, a unique neutrophil population. So, so, so it is very different and it's also sort of goes in a sort of more primitive like state. Thank you very much. Very, very impressive talk. Uh, I, I have not a question directly related to your uh, uh, metabolic findings, but I was wondering what's about erythropoietin or stuff like this if they survive 18 minutes and more under anoxia. Is this upregulated? Yes. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't. Wait. So it's a, uh, it's a normal uh, system. So normally you compensate it by increase of hematocrit and your uh, hemoglobin levels. Is this altered in addition to these metabolic changes? Yes, it's. Uh, they do increase it. They also have a more neonatal isoform of hemoglobin, which would have a high affinity for oxygen. Um, so I think they they are basically adapted in several ways. So it's not only their metabolism that's adapted to it, but you know the whole system is adapted. Yeah. Because I may may this may be important because for utilizing the sucrose and all this glucose, you need oxygen, right? Which is uh, sometimes missing. And if this is also an adaptation, is interesting. In the second part, I'm I'm not sure if this. I got right. You you see an upregulation of cyclic nucleotides in your naked mole, cyclic A and cyclic GM, and not in the normal. Exactly. So, so, so where does this come from? The the well, we don't know. The the, most, the the thing that we see the most, which which is what we're studying at the moment is cyclic CMP. And this is a, a nucleotide that has not really been characterized much. There's just been one report very recently that's, that it's involved in bacterial immunity. And, and this cyclic nucleotide is present in the naked moral in all tissues and you never find it in the, in the mouse. And it's also very much upregulated under anoxic conditions, particularly in the brain. And so we're now trying to study what this is signaling and where it's coming from. 
Yes, thank you for this interesting talk and uh, reactivating my faint um, biochemistry um, memories. So I was wondering, um, you explained like how, how more energy enters or comes in from from the substrate side, so to say, but but uh, what on the product side? You mentioned there's more lactate, but 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 I guess there are um, limits if you if you limit oxidative uh, metabolism at the end, you have to get rid of these uh, products because at the end they otherwise would also become toxic, right? Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're studying this as well. So this, we see this increase in lactate because these are taken from tissues that have been removed from the body and are basically just in a tube. And so there's nowhere where for the lactate to go. When we do in vivo studies, we don't see this la such extreme lactate accumulation. So they also upregulate the um, transporters for lactate and they're probably somehow recycling it. So we're looking into how they're getting rid of this as well. Do we have any questions in Leverkusen? If, sorry, in St. Louis. <laughs> Uh, w one question here. I'm curious. You, you mentioned that there's an unusual insulin uh, system in naked mole rats as well. Is it, could you explain a little bit more about that? And is that in any way related to the tolerance of the, these higher sugar concentrations during yes. hypoxia? So, yeah, so I think they are related. So the, the difference is, is that the insulin has a mutation in it. And so it is not... So first of all, we cannot even um, detect it with any standard ELISAs. Um, also, when you get, when you do a glucose tolerance test, they are extremely glucose intolerant, meaning that the glucose stays up. However, when you give them insulin, they take the glucose up very, very quickly. And so it looks like the insulin is mutated and not working, um, whereas the insulin signaling pathway is retained and is very sensitive. Um, and on top of that, what they what they do have is very high IGF-2 um, expression in the liver and in the blood. And so they, they may be using, once again, a more fetal-like way to basically handle glucose. Um, and so potentially it's the IGF-2 that is somehow signaling also um, to store this glycogen in the heart and so on. We have time for another quick question in St. Louis. Um, have you seen these glycogen deposits in other organisms, like in other species, that they are tolerant to hypoxia? I haven't, but I think there's been reports of turtles having high glycogen. Um, so this might be something that uh, is like a conserved evolutionary thing where under low oxygen conditions, we tend to rely more on, on glycogen. Can it be? Is there any way you can increase glycogen by other means? So that, uh, you know, let's say the normal mouse can tolerate this hypoxia. Yeah, so... Yeah, the, the problem is, is that uh, in, in humans and mice, sometimes too much glycogen is associated with diseases, but that usually comes with a dysregulated breakdown. So there's even diseases like Pompey's disease that is your, your heart tends to have too much glycogen because it, for example, doesn't have this GAA protein in glycophagy. Um, but there, there's... Other means, there's mouse models that do store more glycogen. Um, so there's an AMPK subunit that is mutated that can store more glycogen. And so, yes, we're exploring whether something like this um, as an acute uh, way to, to deal with uh, hypoxic situations. 